Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Island Uplift's History Class. It is so good to have you in today's class. Now in today's session, we will be looking at the European rivalry, or we will continue to look at the European rivalry in the Caribbean region. And specifically, we'll take a look today at the British colonial system. Now, these are our objectives for this topic, and we have three main objectives that we would like to cover. Firstly, we're going to take a look at the governing of the English colonies, which involves the proprietary system, the governor and the council, the assembly, the church, the law, and the military service. Then we'll take a look at the old colonial system, which would involve us looking at economic theories of empire, which includes mercantilism, as well as the mercantilist view of the Dutch. And finally, we'll look at the navigation acts. And specifically, we'll take a look at enumerated goods, the Consolidation Acts, the Board of Trade, and advantages and disadvantages of the Navigation Acts. So let's get into it. So let's take a look at governing the English colonies. And remember, in our last episode, we would have already taken a look at the proprietary system. Now, the English colonies initially belonged to the British Crown with the British Parliament having no control over them. However, the British monarch, King Charles I, wanted to have ownership of the colonies, but not have to handle the extra expenses that came with the colonies. So Charles decided to hand the colonies over to proprietors. Remember, we spoke about this in our last episode, who were persons who were willing to invest money into the establishment and continued development and governance of the colony. These proprietors would be given a royal charter, which would highlight their rights and powers. Now, the proprietors were more figureheads who acted as the owners of the colonies. The king would usually allow them to do so, providing that they pay their dues to the crown. The actual administration within the colony was overseen by persons appointed by proprietors called the governors. Even with the governor, however, the crown would be involved in foreign affairs and trade due to the immense revenue that could be accumulated. And in the midst of the crown accumulating revenue from colonies, persons who would have discovered or first settled some of these islands, such as Thomas Warner in St. Kitts and the Quartin brothers in Barbados, needed the charters from the crown to help them achieve monopoly rights. Such rights would help them to develop their colony solely for their profit. It became clear that in all of this, greater administrative structure was needed to deal with colonial affairs. Now with the proprietary system came a conflict of administrative duties. While the system was in place, a series of solutions to this conflict began to emerge. The committees of the Privy Council of the King was set up to deal with the colonial matters as they arose. Then the period of the interregnum where there was no king saw the beginning of the depletion of the proprietary system. This led to the British government assuming responsibility firstly by the appointment of the Earl of Warwick as commissioner for all West Indian colonies in the year 1643. Then by the year 1650, an institution derived from the idea of the committees of the Privy Council was set up to deal with all colonial matters, with Jamaica being the first colony to test this experiment instead of the proprietary system. This led to the eventual end of the proprietary system. Then in the year 1663, the crown colony system was put in place where all colonies would be under the direct governance of the king. And this was after the interregnum period when the monarchy was re-established. Now the colonies were now referred to as crown colonies. And then by the year 1672, the crown colonies were governed by a committee known as the Council for Trade and Plantations. So before you here is a map, and as you see highlighted in the red pink areas, these are the territories that belong to England in the West Indies, what became known as the British West Indies. So let's look at the governor and his council. Under the Crown Colony system, each colony was developed with the aim of them becoming something like a miniature England. Now, this was not just reflected in culture, 
language or architecture, it was reflected in the colony system of government. So let's say we have England and then we have the Crown Colony. Now we know in England, the three members or the three echelons of the British or English government are first the King, the House of Lords, and of course, the House of Commons. In the Crown Colony, there was something like a mirror effect where the governor would represent the king, the governor's council would represent or reflect rather, reflect is a better word here, would reflect the House of Lords and the assembly would represent the House of Commons. In our modern context today in the English speaking Caribbean, we can say the governor would be someone like a prime minister, the governor's council could be like a cabinet, and the assembly could be seen as the members of parliament. I'm just giving a, a little imagery here to help you to understand. All right. Now, the governor was essentially the king's representative. He was paid his salary between £1,000 and £2,000 by the crown, which was meant to cover personal expenses as well as expenses for entertaining visitors. He was dependent on presents that were given to him by the assemblies. However, there was a growing trend where members of the assembly would use the presence to bribe the governor <laughs> into doing their bidding. Oh, my Lord. Now, the crown overseer the colonies through an institution called the Council of Trade and Plantations. Now, this council began arranging governors in the region, initially placing one governor over many territories. This was the case after, 19, of, after 1660, sorry, when one governor was placed over the Leeward Islands and Barbados. However, that proved to be disadvantageous. So in the year 1671, the Leeward Islands and Barbados received separate governors, which makes sense. All the Leeward Islands were governed by a governor-in-chief who was based in Nevis at first, and then he was based in Antigua from the year 1687. In turn, each of the Leeward Islands were then governed by individual lieutenant governors. Now, the governor was given an official home of residence. He was made captain general to defend the colonies. He had responsibilities of upkeeping the forts on the islands. He also had to train the local militia. And he was sometimes given the prerogative, sometimes given the prerogative to choose members of a council that would advise him. Now, to be a council member, you had to be a prominent settler who possessed good estate and you were debt free. Now, this was usually a seven man council. And although the governor was given prerogatives sometimes to choose the members of the seven man council, on a more regular basis, it was really the king who chose the members of this council. And the king would have done this in as his way of checking on the governor. Remember when we looked at the Spanish administration in the Caribbean, same thing the, the monarchy in Spain did. Um, this was something that the King of England would have done to kind of check and make sure that the governor is doing as the crown desires him to do. Let's take a look at the assembly. Now, the Barbados Assembly was the first of such institutions in the British West Indies, being formed in the year 1639, and check this, lasting until Barbados acquired political independence in the year 1966. That is impressive. That has not been the case with any other country in the British West Indies. Now, with the other islands, although that was not the case in terms of the length of continuity, such assemblies were developed during the interregnum, such as in Jamaica. And by the time the monarchy was restored, they were too well established to be abolished. If it's not broken and if it's well established, I guess you leave it alone, <laughs> right? Now, members of a colonial assembly most likely would have originated from a general meeting of all free men. As the colony's population members grew, they would have been chosen first by a claim and then subsequently through an open voting process. Now, since they were chosen from all free men and voted upon, assembly members tended to be poorer than the governor's council members. 
Now, both the council and the assembly would have sat together during the interregnum. But after the interregnum and the beginning of the restoration of the monarchy, the governor would make the decision as to whether they should sit together or not. Now, the governor had to uphold the king's rights and privileges, but the assembly had to represent the local interests. And we know from that statement alone, that could result in major issues. So this, of course, led to tensions between the governor and the council and the assembly. So whenever they met their tensions, and we see it in our parliaments today, up to this day. <laughs> All right, but that's for another story. The assembly also had legislative power. So they prioritize the needs of the colony over the requests of the crown. And they also obtain, and here's the big one, the assembly also obtained treasury power, which was called the power of the purse, which made them withhold money from the governor to satisfy their interests. Oh my Lord. <laughs> now governors would have tried to persuade assemblies to pass perpetual revenue acts, which would have created fixed incomes for the governors that would be beyond the control of the assemblies. They tried, they tried, but this was always done in vain. Now, members of the assembly, they seldom wanted to vote on money issues. Besides refraining from benefiting the governor, the assembly did not want to vote on anything that would incur heavy taxation or heavier taxation, which would have been felt by the planters, and the planters were the people who the assembly primarily represented. Now, another cause of conflict between the governor and the assemblies were duty prices on exports. Colonial legislatures had to pay 4.5% duty on exports after the year 1673. The assemblies insisted that that should be used by the home government to defend the colonies or to build up a defense network for the British colonies. But when the governor and the council ignored this and there was no evidence of defense, we, <laughs> the assemblies would use their power of the post and withhold any payments. So it's trouble. Oh, my Lord. Let's take a look at another institution that was part of the governing body in the British West Indies, the church. Now, English colonies were founded almost entirely by Anglicans. Anglicans were the Protestants who formed the Church of England after breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the first move to establish a Church of England in the West Indies was in the year 1641 in Barbados. Sunday morning attendance was compulsory and dissenters were punished. The Bishop of London assumed responsibility for the spiritual welfare of the British West Indian colonies in the year 1634. His task was to appoint clergy. However, as time went by, his influence dwindled and the governor was allowed to issue licenses to preachers and to install clergy in designated parishes. It brings up the whole um, separation, separation of church and state argument here. <laughs> That's for another time, all right? Now, the islands were subdivided into parishes. Anglican clergy in the parishes were responsible for carrying out marriages, baptisms, and burials. The local government then gave these clergymen the responsibility to keep register, to keep a register, sorry, of all their parishioners. This made the local government and legislature dependent on the parishes in collecting taxes, in publishing laws, and holding elections. So you see how vital the Anglican Church was to the, Eng the British West Indies society in those days. Now, each parish was administered by a body called the vestry. The vestry was made up of the vicar, who was a leading clergyman, or rector, along with elected men from among the parishioners. The vestry handled the stipends given for the vicar, which came from the local registrar, and in essence, the vestry helped to form each colony's local government. Let's now look at the law. Now, settlers in the colonies were subjects to the King of England, and therefore, they had the legal status of being citizens of England, but there was one exception. The exception was that they could not be represented in the English parliament. 
So they lived on the conditions in which Magna Carta and the ancient statutes and island laws of England were prevalent. Now, Magna Carta was a peace treaty which was instituted in the year 1215 by King John of England, which declared that the king and his government were not above the law. That's what it essentially declared. Now, when laws were passed, they were then published in all churches on the island the next day. Now, there were three levels of judiciary in the British West Indian colonies. Firstly, there was the justice of the peace. Now, this was an unpaid position with someone appointed to deal with minor cases with fines up to 40 shillings. Then there was the parish or precinct courts, and these courts dealt with more severe cases with fines of up to 25 pounds. And then there was the Supreme Court. Now, each island was given a Supreme Court to deal with the most severe of crimes. So you had the Justice of the Peace. And if you want to appeal to a higher court, you had to appeal to your parish or precinct court. And of course, if you wanted to appeal to a higher court and you were eligible to appeal to a higher court, you could then appeal to the Supreme Court because all minor cases could have been um, appealed to the Supreme Court. And then, of course, there was the highest court in the British Empire, the Privy Council. All right. Now, in the early days of the colonies, the judiciary was very weak with unqualified lawyers filling leadership posts and amateur justice of the peace, judges and chief justices, my love. Many of these persons were appointed for social and financial reasons rather than because of their skill with the law. Now the planter class dominated the judiciary and justice was often difficult to obtain. The then governor-in-chief of the Leeward Islands, Christopher Codrington the Younger, sought to fix this issue by asking for the appointment of an attorney general. The idea was obtained from the already present position known as lieutenant general, who oversaw military matters. So let's use a little common sense here. So if we have a lieutenant general who could oversee military matters, and this lieutenant general is a military personnel, then we could have an attorney general who is skilled in the law, who could oversee all legal matters in the colonies. It's a good idea. But his idea was initially disregarded, but it would actually be adopted later on. And of course, in the British West Indies, or rather in the former British colonies, we know we are very well familiar with the position known as the Attorney General. <laughs> All right. Now let's take a look at military service. Now England was initially reluctant to provide the colonies with any military service because of the expenses associated with such an endeavor, money, 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 money. Also many British soldiers would have died because of tropical diseases, which the Crown saw as being a huge wastage of manpower. So as a result, British naval ships did not make regular trips to the colonies until about the 18th century. Wow. <laughs> now, the defense of the island colonies was left up to the governor and his training of men. So you better make sure you have a good governor who knows some military training <laughs> and his training of men who would form a local militia. All able-bodied men between the years 16 and 60 years old were liable for military service. Small farmers and eventually bonded white servants, they formed most of the militia. Now, the militia had three main enemies against which they had to defend themselves. One, from foreign attacks, primarily from the Spanish, and as we will learn in our next episode, the Buccaneers. Two, slave revolts, and three, the Kalinagos. Now, the British militia became quite paranoid, in particular with slave revolts. And we're going to see more of this as the episodes progress, right? A series of laws called deficiency laws were passed, which required a planter to employ a minimum number of white servants so that the ratio of whites to blacks could be kept at one to ten, this, in their view, would lessen the likelihood of revolts and would place the militia in a strategic position to make a counterattack in the case that a revolt was really to occur. 
Now the militia was commanded by the governor with colonels and captains under him. Those colonels and captains were in charge of regiments and companies. Now this meant that large numbers of the island's population were involved with the militia, but this was a huge problem because a lot of these persons who it was required of them to, to give military service, they were farmers and they wanted time to deal with their agricultural produce. They had to make their money. But then when the government, when the crown, sorry, uh, required that they um, do military service and the local government required that they do military service, then how much time are they actually getting to deal with their crops so that their families and the colony itself could benefit? So major issues came up from that. As a matter of fact, in Barbados, at one point in time, there were over, um, there were tens of thousands, I think like 17,000 uh, military personnel, um, how many thousand cavalry, and it, 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 it was a lot because a lot of these persons were the persons who had to do the agriculture, the manual labor in agricultural produce, in, in producing agricultural products, you know, so major issues came about there. Now let's take a look at the old colonial system. And we're gonna to begin to look at economic theories of empire, specifically looking at an interesting theory called mercantilism. Now the term old colonial system refers to the relationship between England and her colonies from the year 1650 to the year 1776. The year 1650 was a year after the beginning of the interregnum, which was a period in which there was no monarchy in England, and we knew this from our last episode, and the year 1776 marked the high point year of the revolution of the North American colonies, which we also know as the American Revolution. Now, during the 17th and 18th centuries, the economies of the island colonies were seen as being subservient to that of England's economy. Now, England would receive from her colonies raw materials that, cannot, that she cannot produce, such as sugar, tobacco, and other crops, and the colonies would receive from England manufactured goods primarily to help in the processing of such crops and for other purposes. Now, theoretically, they seem like two economies complementing each other. But in reality, the colonies were, in fact, as we just mentioned, subservient to England. Along with preferential treatment by the crown of residents on mainland England versus colonists, exclusivism was the main factor that frustrated the colonies. Despite working along well with the Dutch and the French in the earlier years, England demanded, and I think this was a bit ungrateful of England too. England demanded that her colonies only trade with her, England, supplying all their produce to her and then buying imported goods only from her. Wow, we saw that with Spain. But we remember this point of view, this viewpoint rather, this economic theory of viewpoint, it was not just adopted by England. This was something that was really seeping through Western Europe. Now, interestingly, most European nations adopted this economic system, which the British called mercantilism. Mercantilism can be defined as an economic theory that states that trade generates wealth and is stimulated by the accumulation of profitable balances, which a government should encourage by means of, and this is the key point of it, by means of protectionism, or in the case of many European nations, exclusivism. Now, essentially, mercantilism sought to produce more exports <laughs> while lessening imports, uh, with, in this case, the aim of acquiring bullion which was the name given for both gold and silver. Now, Western Europe generally had a mercantilist view in relation to their colonies. A mercantilist viewpoint can be explained using the following three points. One, mercantilists believe that there was a fixed amount of productive land in the world and that the greater a country's share of land, the richer that country would be. Two, 
Mercantilists believe that the fixed amount of trade comes from land and that the greater the share of land, the greater the trade will be, thereby producing more wealth. And three, mercantilists believe that wealth consisted of bullion, which was gold and silver, and that the wealth of a country was measured by the amount of bullion that it had. Buying goods from foreign countries should therefore be limited, even avoided, as it resulted in the loss of bullion. Whoa. <laughs> But selling goods to other countries should be embraced and encouraged as it brought in bullion. Okay, interesting point of view on the mercantilist side there. Now, mercantilists believed in capturing all the land that you could and then prevent as many countries as possible from doing the same. Spain seemed to be the most ideal of mercantilists as they possessed the largest of the Caribbean islands, they possessed Mexico, they possessed the Yucatan Peninsula, they possessed practically all of Central America, and they also possessed what was known then as the Viceroyalty of Peru, where their silver mines were. Spain, however, frequently went bankrupt. What? This was due to Spain's strict level of exclusivism, as well as their lack of understanding of how economics truly works. If you're going to be exclusive, where you're telling your colonies, listen, it's me and you, nobody else, then you have to know your economics. Their idea, meaning the Spanish, their idea was that more bullion meant more wealth. But we know in economics, it's not really that simple. In reality, if bullion increase, but there is no corresponding increase in the supply of goods, then prices will skyrocket. Prices will just keep rising, resulting in the crippling of the economy if it is not managed properly. So mercantilism therefore resulted in conflicts, especially between colonists and their local government and therefore the crown because of this exclusivism. It also led to international wars such as the Anglo-Dutch wars and other wars. These wars were of course for control of land and trade. Now mercantilism actually worked better for the English than the Spanish, which is kind of weird because even though the English had less land, the land produced many valuable crops, including the king of them all, sugar. Sugar helped bring in immense bullion for the English. This led England to becoming self-sufficient with a strengthened economy, trade mechanism, and military, especially the Royal Navy. But then there was an interesting person in the eyes of the mercantilists, or rather, when I say person, I mean a group of people, a particular nation that, that baffled mercantilists, and that was the Dutch. You see, the Dutch were an exception to mercantilism, and therefore the Dutch would have been seen as an anomaly in the eyes of mercantilists. Despite their small geographic size, because they didn't have much land space on mainland Europe, and their small population, the Dutch controlled the world's trade routes. Remember, we spoke about the Dutch in our last episode, so you can check out that episode for more information as to how the Dutch became so powerful. Most notably were their control of the spice and slave trades. Now, even the colonies from other nations that produce raw materials had to depend primarily on Dutch ships to transport such goods. <laughs> wow. Now, despite the growth that Portugal, France, England, and even Spain experienced, none were able to match the dominance of the Dutch on the seas. Interestingly, the Dutch were not occupied by acquiring lands or colonies as the other nations were. Instead, their priority was on trade. This meant that along with having a vast number of ships at their disposal, the Dutch were quite possibly possessors of more advanced economic knowledge than the rest of Europe. Because if your emphasis is on trade, then you have to know your economics pretty well. <laughs> All right. Now, during the interregnum, 
Cromwell saw the Dutch as a threat to English trade with the West Indies and especially with Barbados. He therefore decided to pass a series of acts that would deal with foreign threats to England's trade. These acts became the foundation of England's mercantilist views and policies and were called the Navigation Acts. So let's take a look at what these Navigation Acts were really all about. Between the years 1650 and 1776, the relationship between England and her colonies was governed by a series of acts known as the Navigation Acts. The acts essentially tied the colonies to England only. Now, the first act was passed in the year 1650 by Oliver Cromwell during the Interregnum. This act stated that foreign vessels were prohibited from trading with English colonies. All goods also had to be carried by English ships only. This first act was passed because of Cromwell's personal policies, the preferences of merchants in London, the threat posed from the Dutch trade, and threats of revolts from islands such as Barbados, which we would have dealt with in our previous episode, so you can go and check it out. Now, the second act, the second navigation act was passed one year later in the year 1651, and it stated that goods, and it was a bit more specific here, it stated that goods from Africa, America, and Asia had to be carried on English ships or ships of the country of origin into England. Also, goods coming from Europe had to be carried on English ships or on a ship from the country of the origin of that specific good, of those goods. Now, these two acts were quite noticeably crafted, not just for general legislator, but it was evident that they were crafted to be pinpointed at the Dutch. The passing of these acts even led to the first Dutch war, which occurred from 1652 to 1654. Now, after the interregnum, when the monarchy was reinstituted, King Charles II saw Cromwell's navigation acts as obsolete. But check this, he saw the acts as obsolete, but he adopted the principles of them. <laughs> so technically, he didn't see it as obsolete, although it was officially stated he saw it as obsolete. He therefore passed a new navigation act in the year 1660, which stated that all goods to and from the colonies had to be carried on English or colonial ships. Now, these ships had to have a captain with a crew that was 75% English, Irish, or colonial. The aim was to prevent any other national from profiting in any way and to most of all prevent the Dutch from profiting. Now, this act also introduced a concept called enumerated goods. Now, these were goods that could only be carried to England or to another English colony. Now, they included cotton, sugar, ginger, indigo, dye woods. We spoke about dye woods in the last episode, especially when they met dye woods on the island of Barbados, and they said we could use it to open up a timber industry, and tobacco. Wow. Now, England wanted exclusivity to these goods. However, she also acted as a middleman selling these products to other European nations at a profit. <laughs> now, the Staple Act of 1663 then stated that goods going to colonies from foreign countries had to pass through England first. The only exception to this were wine that was, was wine, sorry, that was coming from Azores, from the Azores Islands, and Madeira Island, which was off the coast of um, Portugal. Now, 10 years later in the year 1673, the Plantation Duties Act was passed. This act levied an export duty of 4.5% on enumerated goods before shipment from a colonial port. The English did this to raise money on colonial trade. However, the high duties led many captains to smuggle goods to foreign ports to avoid English customs duties. 
<laughs> then we have the Consolidation Act and the institution of the Board of Trade. Now, in the year 1696, the Consolidation Act was passed, and it basically put all the previous acts together. It, 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 it fused them together. It also helped to enforce the Navigation Acts better. The Plantation Duties Act of 1673 had resulted in the appointment of customs officials in each colony to help governors collect the duty tax of 4.5%. Then, three years later, in the year 1676, separate officers who were also called naval officers or clerks of the naval office were appointed to carry out this task. Now, colonial courts were reluctant to prosecute breaches of the Navigation Acts. In response to this, the Consolidation Act created the Viceroyalty Courts, which dealt with all maritime cases and breaches of the Navigation Acts. Then, in the year 1696, the same year the Consolidation Act was passed, the Board of Trade was created. It was set up to administer all matters of trade within the colonies. The board consisted of eight members who were known as Lords of Trade and Plantations. Okay. <laughs> their function as a board was to encourage development in the colonies, to supervise their administrative functions, and of course, to ensure that the navigation acts were being implemented. And finally, we want to take a look at, you see, these navigation acts, they were put in place and they were what really helped to uphold England's mercantilist view. But let's look at some advantages and disadvantages of these navigation acts. Let's look at some advantages to England. Firstly, because of England's monopoly of colonial produce, they were able to exploit this position by buying colonial goods at a low price, which the colonies were forced to accept or not sell at all. In return, England would re-export and profit by the higher foreign market prices. Two, the colonies had to buy from England, thereby allowing England to exploit them. <laughs> wow. Three, England had a guaranteed supply of tropical products such as tobacco and sugar. Four, the Plantation Duties Act of 1673 allowed colonial trade to become a source of revenue for England. And five, English merchants benefited a lot. And the Royal Navy became stronger in its ships as well as its array of trained sailors. But there were just a few advantages of these navigation acts to the colonies themselves. Firstly, the colonies had a guaranteed market for their produce. England would take all their produce, making the search for markets not a matter of concern. And two, the colonies were protected in time of war. In this case, foreign ships were not allowed to cross the Atlantic Ocean because of the strength of the Royal Navy. However, these navigation acts were also disadvantageous to the colonies. So let's look at some disadvantages of the navigation acts to the colonies. One, slaves were not on the list of enumerated goods and the colonies were allowed to sell them to foreign buyers. Settlers were therefore at a disadvantage as they had to compete for slaves against foreign buyers even from the Spanish. As a matter of fact, many of them prefer to buy from the Spanish because you know when you buy from the Spanish, you always get paid, always get paid in gold or silver, in bullion, <laughs> all right? Two, the Navigation Acts impacted Jamaica in a special way tremendously because the island would have traded slaves and manufactured goods for bullion with the Spanish colonies in Central and South America. Now, the English authorities knew that this was happening, but they let it happen. They, they kind of turned a blind eye to this because although it was against the Navigation Act, they needed the bullion. They needed the gold and the silver. So they allowed this to happen. And three, the West Indian colonies had to buy expensive goods and sell them cheaply. They did not have the luxury of looking for the best markets because the Navigation Acts tied their trade to England only. So in conclusion, the British colonial system was defined by three main factors, 
the proprietary and subsequent administrative and ownership systems, the mercantilist view in the old colonial system, and the navigation and subsequent acts. Now, these factors help to establish a sense of British dominance in the region and to an extent across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, many of these factors have been adopted and still are used by Caribbean societies. It is therefore important to study them and see how and why they still impact us to this day. And this is where we come to an end of our look at the British colonial system. Now, things are going to get even more heated. So in our next episode, we're going to take a look at the last part of our look at European rivalry. And specifically, we're going to take a look at the age of the Buccaneers. But this has been another episode of Island Uplift's History Class, and I hope to see you in the next one. But for now, class dismissed.